This video is brought to you by Mubi. Get 30 days of Mubi for free when you go to mubi.com slash thomasflight. One of my favorite techniques in Nope is about to happen right here. Did you catch that? Listen again. Was that the wind? Or maybe something else? If you've seen the movie, you know the answer. But the first time you watched it, you probably didn't know what you were hearing or if you were hearing anything out of the ordinary at all. For me, the most unsettling moment in Nope was this one. A long tracking shot that doesn't really show you anything. A big part of why this moment is so effective is because it creates terror instead of horror. At the start of every Jordan Peele movie, you'll see a title card for his production company. Monkey's Paw, said Mrs. White curiously. The name of the company, Monkey Paw Productions, is a reference to a short story by W.W. Jacobs. Hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud, said the sergeant major. But I warn you of the consequences. In this story, when an old man and his family are visited by a mysterious traveler, he receives a magical dried monkey paw that can grant three wishes. The old man, hoping to better the financial situation of his family, asks for the sum of 200 pounds with his first wish. The old man and his family expect the money to fall out of the sky or appear under his pillow. When that doesn't happen, they suspect the paw may be a hoax. But the next day, the old man and his wife receive another visitor, telling them that their son died tragically in an accident at work, and he gives them compensation of 200 pounds, fulfilling the first wish. They're struck with grief, and after burying their son, they have an idea. The old man uses the paw again, his second wish that his son would be alive again. They wait for hours and nothing happens, but after night falls, they're awoken by a knocking at the door. The old man, now reminded of the twisted nature of the granting of the first wish, is terrified of what might be on the other side of that door. And in an act of desperation, before his wife can answer the door, he grabs the paw and uses his third wish to wish whatever is on the other side of that door would disappear. When they open the door, nothing is there. It's a gripping story, but the brilliance of it is that as readers, we never actually see anything horrifying. The author leaves it to our imagination and leaves the actual existence of the horror ambiguous. Film writer Matthew Morgan, in an essay about what this story can tell us about the distinction between horror and terror, puts it this way. This is the essence of terror. It is the gut-deep dread of the awful possibilities. Horror, by contrast, is what we'd have if the story allowed the door to be opened before the final wish could be made, to reveal whatever monster stood there. Jordan Peele understands this dynamic between horror and terror and utilizes it frequently in Nope. In the Gordy's house scenes, he expertly holds back and obscures the horror of the scene instead allowing our imagination to do the work, inspiring terror. Spielberg does the same thing in this sequence from the opening of Jaws, where he frames out the carnage that we all know is present. Hiding it instead of showing it builds anticipation for what might be shown and leaves a question in the viewer's mind about the true nature of the horror we're not seeing. I wanna show how these ideas, ambiguity, our imagination, and the distinction between terror and horror can play out within the sound design of a film. One of Jaws' most tense scenes is early on, we know there's been a shark attack, but the beaches haven't been closed. So Chief Brody sits on the beach watching and waiting. And crucially, so does the audience. There's a lot that Spielberg is doing here to build suspense and anticipation, but one of the most clever things he does is use visual ambiguity. 
For example, this woman's feet look a little bit like a shark fin, and this splashing looks like it could be a shark attack. When the film is quickly cutting back and forth between the ocean and Brody, scanning the water tensely for signs of a shark, these little visually ambiguous elements momentarily trick us into thinking we might be seeing a shark or an attack. But you can create ambiguity in sound as well. Spielberg does this in this scene with the screen. I can't get down to the office and that garbage truck. It turns out to just be someone having fun, but for a split second, we might think they're screams of terror. Jordan Peele and his sound designer Johnny Burns took advantage of sonic ambiguity to design the sound of the UFO for Nope. Our ears have a difficult time distinguishing between two sounds that overlap within certain frequencies. And they used this fact to their advantage. By designing a sound for the UFO that used animal screams and morphed bird sounds blended seamlessly with sounds of wind, they gave the sound of the UFO an ambiguous quality where you're not quite sure what you're hearing exactly, especially in those early scenes. Let's go. In this moment, like in the scene on the beach from Jaws, we know there's already been an attack and we're waiting for something. Yeah. And among all the other sounds of the night, we're hearing the wind. But there's a little something else in there too. It's hard to figure out what that might be because the sound team keeps using other sounds like the horse's snort here to overlap the other element a little bit. It's like the sonic equivalent of the door, desk, and tablecloth that are shrouding our view of the horror in this shot. And after the tension builds for a while in this scene, we get this sound. A big ambiguous thud that ends up being benign. It's like the sonic version of the visual ambiguity of this splashing in Jaws. All this ambiguity and uncertainty around the sound of the UFO creates anticipation and terror. And it creates an unsettling reveal as the movie progresses when you slowly start to put together the fact that what you're hearing isn't the wind or even some kind of crazy UFO screeching, but actually screams of the UFO's victims. Listen to this. How can you tell these aren't screams of horror? Often the line between a scream of joy or pleasure and horror is a fine one. And like in this case, we might rely on context clues to help figure it out. If we hear the sound of a roller coaster in the background, we assume that the screams are screams of people having fun, or at least the screams of people who aren't imminently in danger. When designing the sound of what happens when people get sucked up into the UFO, they asked the group of actors who recorded these sounds to scream like they were on a roller coaster, and then asked them to scream like, well, they were getting digested by a giant UFO. Then they blended those two together, and the result, what we hear in Nope, is pretty unsettling. Add in the bizarre, rubbery, grating sound you get by rubbing the windscreen of a lavalier microphone you have sonic horror. This mixture, which adds ambiguity to the sound, also plays to the themes of the film I talked about in my last video on Nope. It makes a lot of sense for a movie that's commenting on how the lines between entertainment and real trauma get blurred. Sonic ambiguity is pervasive throughout Nope. In this scene in the barn, we're unsure what sounds are being generated by the sprinkler and what sounds are being generated by the aliens. Jordan Peele chose his sound designer, Johnny Burns, based on his work in Jonathan Glazer's sci-fi horror, Under the Skin, a movie about a predatory alien that stays away from otherworldly sound design and instead uses a naturalistic soundscape to create tension and atmosphere. Nope uses a similar approach. For a movie about a UFO, there's very little otherworldly sound. Instead, the soundscape is mostly naturalistic and domestic, just modified slightly to sound a little out of place. 
Consider the sort of generic banging clunking sound used in the Gordy's home scenes that opens the film. It's more unsettling precisely because it's so mundane. Isolated, it could just be someone banging their shoe on the floor. But given the context, we fear and imagine it could be something so much worse. But ambiguity and uncertainty aren't the only ways sound can create the engagement necessary for an engrossing horror film. We do use focal points sometimes to guide someone into a state of heightened suggestibility. Heightened suggestibility. That's right. That's right. Let's go back to Jaws for a moment. If you think of Jaws and sound, you probably think of this. But there's another element of Jaws sound that I think plays just as big a role as the score does in making these moments impactful. and it's the calm before the storm. In this scene we talked about earlier, as we're introduced to the beach, there's a rich natural soundscape. We hear the radio, we hear people talking, but as the tension mounts and Brody scans the water, listen to what happens to that soundscape. Every day there are hundreds or thousands of sounds in our environment that we ignore or tune out. But I'm sure you remember moments in your own life where you suddenly became aware of the sounds in your environment. These moments of heightened awareness are usually are usually due to fear, anxiety, or being in an unfamiliar situation. Our alertness to the sounds in our environment becomes heightened when we're listening for what we think might be danger. This means that for horror and suspense filmmakers who are trying to place viewers in a heightened state of anticipation or fear, the background soundscape of a film can play a unique role. In a scene where the focus is what people are saying, they'll avoid distracting sounds like this one, the gentle bubbling of a coffee pot, because it's not important information for the scene. And if we were having a day-to-day -day conversation in our real lives with the coffee pot bubbling in the background, our brain would tune it out. But in a moment like this, the lack of meaning in the sound is important. These sounds give our anxious ears something to scan for potential danger, and they allow our imaginations to run wild, wondering what the sound might be or what might be hiding behind it. And then when we're carefully scanning the environment for sounds of danger as the viewer, unnatural silence can be just as important a tool in building anticipation. Listen to this moment from Nope if I highlight just the background sound of the scene. You can hear how all of a sudden it falls away into a very unnatural quiet. This creates a calm before the storm sort of effect. One that's barely perceivable, but one that affects your perception of the scene nonetheless. It's the score and the shark attack, aka the horror, that audiences tend to remember. But it's the soft clanging of the buoy that creates the necessary terror for that horror to hit home. Mubi is a curated streaming service where you can watch beautiful, exceptional, interesting cinema. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film when they hand pick from iconic directors or emerging auteurs. My favorite thing about Mubi is how intentional the library is. Everything is there because someone felt it should be. I also want to tell you about Mubi's new print magazine, Notebook. It's published biannually. If you subscribe, you'll get two issues every year. It's truly a beautiful publication that focuses on the art and culture of cinema. In the first issue, I especially enjoyed Patrick Holzapfel's article, It's impossible to film a garden if you're not a gardener. They are pieces of art in and of themselves, and each issue will come with a special exclusive gift for magazine subscribers. Subscribe to Notebook using the link in the description below and get 30 days of Mubi for free by going to mubi.com slash thomasflight.